You may be seated. Well, we've been, I think we've sung this song once other times since uh, we've been doing Revelation and uh, studying that uh, on those Sunday nights. And uh, you can, boy, just coming right out of that, Revelation chapter 4, uh, chapter uh, 5 as well. The angels exalt the Lamb, the Lamb. You are worthy. You are worthy. For such a great church, great church as Olive Baptist, just saying thanks is easy. The part that's really hard is finding room for all of the thanks on such a little card, uh, such as wind chimes, barbecue, fruit baskets at Christmas, also calls, food, and cards while we have both been ill. We love you much, Richard and Pat Smith. Glad, good to see y'all guys back with us. Uh, James chapter 2, uh, you can turn in your Bible there. Uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau was a philosopher and uh, he said that he was the first man to love all of humanity, to love all of mankind. But in his writings as a philosopher, he said if you disagree with him, then you should be killed. That's what he said. Uh, he, he, he despised his father so much and when his uh, he, he just hated his father and when his father passed away they were unable to locate his brother so he worked and he fought to have his brother declared dead so that he could inherit his father's estate uh, Rousseau he had five children and all five of those children he took to the orphanage in this orphanage, only uh, two or well, two thirds of the children in this orphanage would die before they reached one year of age. If they lived past that, fourteen out of one hundred would not reach. Uh, only fourteen out of one hundred would reach the age seventeen in their life. This man is the man who said he loved all of humanity and all of mankind, but yet this is the same guy that did not give a single child of his a name. Now there's a discrepancy. There's a discrepancy between what this guy said and the way he lived his life. And that's what... James is saying in chapter 2. A lot of people have a problem with James. Uh, a lot of people disagree with James. They do not um, take or they avoid his book in the Bible. They do not take kindly to his teaching. Martin Luther was one of them. You used to have those people today too. But Martin Luther was one of these people. Martin Luther wrote his translation of the Bible in 1520, and he put James at the very end of the New Testament because he didn't like it. But you have to understand. You have to understand a little bit of Martin Luther and where he came from and why he would have done that. Martin Luther was in a monastery. He spent uh, a lot of his time in that monastery, living in that monastery, being taught and trained in that monastery. And in his teaching and in his training that he received, he was taught that you had to earn your salvation. And so that's why he has a problem with James. Martin Luther, he worked and he worked and he worked, but he never felt the forgiveness of God or the love of God in his life. Now, I think Luther misunderstood what James was saying. James talks about works. He talks a great deal about works. And even today, uh, people misunderstand what James is expressing or the point James is trying to get, all, get, a, uh, get through to us as he talks about these works. Paul said, Paul said to the Gentiles, he said, not of works lest anyone should boast. He's writing to these, Paul was writing to these pagans. These pagans were worshiping idols. And they thought uh, these pagans would worship these idols. And whether it was uh, an act that they had to do, whether they had to cut themselves, whether they had to sacrifice their own children, whether they had to uh, just do something, they had to uh, maybe Im Im immorality, something immoral they had to do to entice their God to respond to them. That's who Paul was writing to with these uh, pagan Gentiles that were worshiping that way when he says it's not of works lest anybody should boast. 
They thought they had to work their way to a God. They thought they had to work their way to paradise. They had to work their way to salvation. There's a religion like that today. There's some religions like that today. But that's a great description of, of Islam today. Islam today believes that they have to uh, do have more good than bad in their life to ever think about a, uh, attaining paradise. So James is writing to these Christian Jews is who they are. They have been these Christian Jews and that was this is one of their problems and one of the things that they kept going back to, the Christian Jews, the Jews in that time. Well, I'm a Jew and I'm a child of Abraham, so that automatically takes care of me. Since I'm a Jew, since I'm a child of Abraham, since I can trace my lineage, my family tree, since I can do Ancestry.com, since I can do 23andMe, since I can see how that goes back and where I come from, that I come from Abraham, I'm okay. That's the way the Jews believed. So James is telling him, you're wrong in that. You're wrong to think just because of who your father or your grandfather or your great-grandfather was or where your family tree goes that you are secure, that you're safe, that you're exempt from something. James says it's not the way, it's not just how you're born that you're taken care of. James is saying that a genuine faith is lived out. And that was the problem. Those, these people were not living out their faith. James comes, and that's the key for us, a genuine faith is lived out. If you're thankful for the cross, if you're thankful for grace and mercy, and you're thankful for eternity, then live it out. Show it. Let it be displayed. Live it out. Show it in your life how you come and go. If, if, if your faith is important, if your faith is, is lived out, we'll see it, people will see it, you'll be known by your fruit. You'll be identified that way. You'll be identified, if your faith is lived out, you'll be identified by the way you live your life Monday through Saturday, right? That makes sense, doesn't it? If my faith is genuine, there will be fruit, people will see it, and they'll see it in the way I live. So James says, a genuine faith demonstrates itself by being a working faith. A genuine faith, James is saying a genuine faith doesn't just check in, punch a time clock, come into church on Sunday morning, and then it goes home and it's somebody different. James is saying that's not a genuine faith. A genuine faith is lived out 365 days a year, all day long. He says that's a genuine faith. It's a working faith. That's what James is saying. It's a working faith. A true faith is a working faith that isn't just a turn on and a turn off. It's not a light switch that you turn it on, flip it on, and flip it off. Now here's the first thing that James is going to address and it's a dead faith. That's in verse 14 of chapter 2 of James. So he says, What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but has no works? Can that faith save him? Now again, don't get James wrong. James is not saying you work for salvation at all. James is just saying if you have a genuine faith, there's going, to be, there's going to be something seen in you. It's going to be seen, it's going to be visible as you're out during the day, as you're out of the church walls, as you're mingling with people. James says a genuine faith will be your nature, it'll be a character of you. So he comes in and he says this in, in verse 14, if somebody says he has faith but he has no works, can that faith Save him. So what he's saying is, can you show me how that faith is lived out? Show me how your faith works out. Show me how you live that out. He says, has your life changed? Is there a change to you? A change in a life means there's a working faith. Right? If you're just, if you're at, if you're A before you're saved and you remain A the whole time after salvation... I don't know. I don't know. Only God knows. 
God will know. But there wouldn't be much fruit. There wouldn't be much example. So that's what James is saying. Has the life changed? Is there a change in your life? And then he follows it up and he says, he's really saying, uh, he's really saying, can an unchanged life be a saved life? Can an unchanged life be a saved life? James, what James understood is when you're saved, there's a change. It's not all at once. There's a progressive sanctification that takes place. That means, that means a little bit day by day, more and more, a little at a time, you're becoming more like Jesus Christ. You're moving away from what you were. That should be your goal. A little bit, small steps, maybe one day it's a big step, but other days it's a small step. Maybe some days you even take a step back, but you're progressively, the desire of your heart is to be more like Jesus Christ. That's, what, that's the way James understands it. And that's what he's teaching. That's what he's saying. He's saying old things are, are put away. The past is put away. All things have become new, right? You're a new creation. That's what James is getting across. That's why you get baptized. You get baptized, why? Because the old is gone and the new is resurrected. See, you shouldn't, after, when there's a change in your life, you shouldn't live the way you used to live. When something new is created in you, you don't live the way you used to live, you don't talk the way you used to talk, you don't think the way you used to think, you don't be involved in the same things you used to be involved in, you don't act the way you used to act, you're a new creation. So there's a progressive moving away from what you were. You're instantly saved. Salvation is instantaneous. But your desire is to be more like the one who saved you. So the question is, is a fruitless faith a true living faith? Now that's a good question. That's something to ask. Is a fruitless faith a true living faith? Is an unchanged person really saved? So that's what James is talking about, and now he's going to give this illustration. Verse 15 and 16. So that's good. James gives a point. And then he gives an illustration. If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? So here's the illustration. James says, you're walking by a person, you see them sitting there, they're they're shivering, this person is shivering because they're cold, and what do you tell them? Go in peace. You didn't, you didn't do anything. You just walked by me and tell them, go in peace. So this brother, this sister is sitting there. They're shivering. They're hungry. They can hardly concentrate on anything you're trying to say to them. Why? Because their stomach is just gnawing at them because they are so hungry. And you walk by and you say, blessings, peace be with you, and be filled. And you did nothing to help them. What good is that, James is saying? James is saying, you have the lingo down, you have the words down, you have the verbiage down, but your lifestyle is completely different. Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. James works. He says, if that's the case, if you're the one that just walks by, you see the person, uh, you see the brother or sister, you know about the need, and you walk by and you just tell them, well, I sure hope you get some food this evening. I sure hope that starving or that that, uh, need in your life goes away. I sure hope you get a jacket for yourself this afternoon to protect you from the cold. I sure hope you find a place to stay this evening. I sure hope that need in your life is met. James says if that's the case for you, then your faith is dead. You show no proof of the Lord being Lord in your life. Here's a story. I've got an illustration for you, okay? Here's a story. Chuck Swindoll. I won't have to read this to you, okay? But it's a very good illustration and story that he shares. He says, let's pretend that you work for me. 
In fact, you are my executive assistant in a company that is growing rapidly. I'm the owner, and I'm interested in expanding overseas. He's going to Europe to expand his business. To pull this off, I make plans to travel abroad and stay there until the new branch office gets established. I make all of the arrangements to take my family in the move to Europe for six to eight months, and I leave you in charge of the busy stateside organization. I tell you that I will write you regularly, I will give you direction, and I will send instruction. I leave, I leave, and you stay behind. Months pass. A flow of letters are mailed from Europe and received by you at the national headquarters. I spell out my expectations to you while I'm gone, and finally, I return. So this guy's got the expectations. He's received the letters from the person who's gone out, who's left them in charge, and is expecting them to do something. Soon after my arrival, I drive down to the office. I'm stunned. Grass and weeds have grown up high. A few windows along the street are broken. I walk into the receptionist's room, and she's doing her nails, chewing gum, and listening to her favorite podcast, I guess you would say now. Uh, I, I look around and notice the waste baskets are overflowing. The carpet hasn't been vacuumed for weeks, and nobody seems concerned that the owner has returned. I ask about your whereabouts, and somebody in the crowded lounge area points down the hall and yells, I think he's down there. Disturbed, I move in that direction, and I bump into you in the hall as you are finishing up a chess game with our sales manager. I ask you to step into my office, which has been temporarily converted into a TV viewing room so that y'all can watch your daily soaps. What in the world is going on, man? What do you mean? Well, look at this place. Didn't you get any of my letters? Letters? Oh, yeah, sure. We got every one of them. As a matter of fact, we have a letter study every Friday night since you've left. We have even divided all of the personnel into small groups and distributed many of the letters you wrote to each group. Some of these things were very interesting. You'll be pleased to know that a few of us have actually committed to memory some of your sentences and paragraphs. And beyond that, one or two even memorized a whole letter. Great stuff was in those letters. Okay, okay, you got my letters, you studied them, and you meditated on them, you discussed them and even memorized them, but what did you do about them? Do? Uh, we didn't do anything about them. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound like something we can identify with? We have been given, some people have, we memorize a verse, even if it's just Jesus wept in the beginning, even if that's as far as we can get, we remember something. We do things like that. We hear it. We read it. We listen to it. We even paint scripture on our walls in the house and hang pictures up with that stuff. But we do everything with the word but live it out. Just like this manager was given letters of how to conduct the business while the owner was gone away, he did none of that. He didn't do it. There was good stuff in there, but I didn't live it out. We didn't pull the weed eater out. We didn't trim any branches. We didn't repair the windows. James says, put your faith into practice. Put it into practice. I told you, James is tough. He's tough. Here's the second thing. The false faith. Verse 18. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Okay? We just saw, we just, we've just identified works, works alone, that's not getting you there. You know, you can't work your way into heaven. Okay? But these, remember these Christian Jews, they were thinking they were working. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works and I will show you my faith by my works. So somebody wants to debate him. James says, 
James says, somebody comes in and says, I have faith. And you say, okay, I have works. Okay, what's the deal then? we got one person says, I've got faith. One person says, I've got works. James says, what has your faith produced? James says, my faith has produced something. I've produced something with my faith. That's what he's saying, verse 19. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. Now remember, he's talking to these Jewish Christians. James says, okay, you believe. You're familiar with Scripture. You believe, but guess what? Demons believe. He says, demons believe as well. Demons are good theologians. They know the Word. They know the Word better than most Christians. You don't have to turn it. I'll just read this to you, but Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, verse 31 through 33. This is Jesus. He came down to Capernaum, in a city of Galilee, and He was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were amazed at His teaching, for His message was with authority. In the synagogue, there was a man possessed by the, by the spirit of an unclean demon, and He cried out with a loud voice. Now, the demon shows up at church, right? Synagogue. Are you surprised that Satan shows up at church? Think about that. Let us alone. Satan shows up at church, but these demons aren't expecting to meet somebody else there. It's interesting that he shows up at that place not expecting to see somebody else. Let us alone. What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. The Holy One of God. The demon identifies this. The demon knows. But Jesus rebuked him saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in the midst of the people, he came out of him without doing him any harm. So the demon knows who Jesus is. He knows who he was. He knows knows about him. He knows where Jesus came from. So James is saying, James is saying, you think you're somebody because you know who Jesus is. But he says the demons know who Jesus is and they shudder. They shudder at this. They tremble at this. This demon shows up at church and who's the last person he thinks he's going to run into at church? Jesus. He was not expecting to see Jesus at church. Now that says something. I think that still holds true today. Back to James, verse 20. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellows? But verse 19 says, You believe that God's one. You do well. The demons also believe. But are you willing to recognize, you empty fellows, you foolish fellows, that faith without works is useless. He says they're hollow. They're empty, is what he's saying. It's useless. You foolish people. You empty people. These works are hollow. James points out three things about faith. In verse 16, he says, what use is it? It's no profit. It's, your faith is no profit unless you live it out. It's not profiting anybody or any, anybody outside. In verse 17, he says, the faith, your faith is dead if you're not living it out. He says it's dead unless you live it out. And then here in verse 20, he says it's useless. Your faith is useless. It's barren unless you live it out. And that's what he says. That's what, these are James, the words of James right here. You empty fellow. Faith without works is useless. So this comes straight from the half-brother of Jesus. James says that faith of these Jews is dead. He says it's dead and it has no profit. No profit. Now here's the last thing. A genuine faith. And this is what James says it's about. Uh, It's about a genuine faith is about it being visible. Does God know your heart? Yes. Could you walk an aisle and be saved and go home and lock your door and, and never, you wouldn't even have to walk an aisle. Could you be saved and lock your door at home and still enter eternity? You could. You could. And God knows your heart. God knows your heart. But it's a fruit, you'll have a fruitless faith. You'll have a barren faith. You'll have a hollow faith. It won't be a use to anybody else except yourself. God knows you. 
But let's see here. A genuine faith. How is a genuine faith lived out? So he gives another example. Verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? That's what he's saying. When he offered up Isaac, his son, on an altar. So he says, Abraham. Abraham even was justified by his works. He's living it out. He's demonstrating it. He's modeling it. You see that faith was working with his works. So they were going hand in hand, simultaneously. His faith and his works were moving together. There was something being done. And as a result of the works, faith was perfected. There you go. That's what I was saying earlier. Progressively being perfected. They moved together. Verse 23. And the scripture was fulfilled which says... And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Now, how do we know? How do we know that Abraham is the father of the faithful? Did he walk an aisle and say a prayer? No, he didn't. Abraham didn't do that. He did not walk into a synagogue, a church, uh, a temple, or, or any other place and go to an off altar and say a prayer. What Abraham did, how was it reckoned to him as, as uh, righteousness, as faith? He took his son to an altar and was prepared to sacrifice his own son. How long had Abraham waited for this son? A hundred years. This is his only son. He's going to give his son up that God had promised him. The Hebrews said that Abraham believed that if he killed, in the Hebrews it says that if Abraham believed that if he killed his son, that God would somehow raise him from the dead. And that was counted to him as righteous. That was his, him showing his faith. Let's be clear, clear again. You do not work your way to heaven. It's the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ that gets you to heaven. But faith was working with, alongside, Abraham's work. Somebody walks an aisle. I don't know their heart. God does. God knows their heart. What can I do? I can watch. That's all I can do is watch. Right? That's all you can do is watch. How do we know that Abraham's faith was, was counted as, as, righteousness to, or as righteousness to him? Because we were able to see. Right? We were able to see that faith lived out. Just because somebody walks an aisle, I don't know. God knows. What do I do? I watch. I see. I visualize. I, I see if they're living this faith out. Works do not justify us before God. Works justify us before man. Look at verse 22. It says, you see that faith was working with his works. Verse 24 says, you see that a man is justified by his works and not faith alone. You see. Is that what, that's what it says? It says, you see. You see. Man sees. Man sees it lived out. Your faith is lived out in the eyes of man to justify something that's happened in your life. If you continue to tell the same stories, do the same thing, act the same way, live your life the same way as you did before you said when you walked an aisle and you met Jesus Christ, I don't have any proof. The, the dying world, the world going to hell, doesn't see a change. James says there should be a change. And that's lived out. So you see. God has already seen, but now you see. God sees, now you see. You don't show God, God knows your heart. You show others that there's been a change in your life. Your witness, your works is a witness before man of what God has done in your heart. So let me show you. This is the last application. Last application for us. Somebody comes. Somebody comes and they give their life to Christ. And they go home. What do they, this person, this person gives their life to Christ uh, they say they're a changed person. They go home, and as they're leaving, as they're leaving that person, as they're leaving uh, the church that morning, they say, "I'm going to go home, and I'm going to straighten everybody out. I'm going to go home, and I'm going to lay the law down. I'm going to tell them what they've been doing. I'm going to beat them. I'm going to crawl up their backside. I'm just really going to lay right into them. I'm going to set everybody straight. That if you die right now, you'll bust hell wide open." So let's assume. Let's assume this is a husband. 
What if it's a husband who has that encounter with God and he says, I'm going to go home and I'm going to tell everybody in that household that they're going to bust hell wide open. I'm going to crawl all, all over them. Well, what if you, husband, don't go home and beat somebody to death about what they've been doing, but you go home and you pick up your clothes? I thought I'd get an amen from you ladies. You live with a perfect man, I guess. What about, husband, if you go home, you pick up your clothes, you set the table, you clean the dishes, you put the dishes up, you tell your wife, how about you just go sit down over there and I'll take care. I see a couple of you looking at the other one now. Don't, don't do it. Oh, I heard an amen now. How about you sit down over there and let me go do all this other stuff and what's that wife going to say? Instead of you coming home and telling her how, how she's going to bust hell wide open if she doesn't straighten up her act and how good you are now, but you go home and you start doing some things, and what's, what's the wifey going to say to the husband? She's going to say, what in the world has gotten into you? You're going to say, Jesus? Jesus has gotten into me. And what's she going to say? She's going to say, well, I'm going to sit down here and I'm going to watch. You got it now? You see it? See, it all? you just connected all the dots right there. The outside world's going to watch. You see? You see? You see, or the teenager, the teenager goes off to, we'll just say youth camp, go off to youth camp, they, they're energized, they're fired up, they come home from youth camp, they've met Jesus Christ there, they come home to youth camp, and they think, well, I'm going to tell my siblings, I'm going to tell my brother and sister, I'm going to tell my mom and dad how they're going to bust hell wide open if they don't get their life straight and then get in line with God. How about that teenager go home? And they pick up their room without being told, without being bribed. How about they go home and they're obedient to mom and dad. They don't backtalk mom and dad. They're attentive in school. They don't give the teachers trouble in school anymore. What are the teachers and the parents going to say to that teenager? What has gotten into you? And what can that teenager say? Jesus. And what's that teacher and that parent going to say? Well, I'm going to sit back and watch, right? That's what they're going to say. If Jesus has gotten into you, then I'm going to sit back and watch. It works at the job site. works anywhere you go. No one is beyond God's reach. And no one is beyond living out their faith. Live out your faith to a dying world that needs to be reached. You see? They see. They're watching. If Jesus has changed your, changed your life, live it. Live it out. I want to ask you to bow your head and stand this morning. I hope maybe this connected a dot for you. Maybe this illuminated something in your life, showed you something... Uh, you understand that your salvation is secure, but you're working to be better. And maybe you would like to, to go and just beat somebody over the head with Scripture, and, but maybe what they need to see is you live it out. Maybe they haven't seen you live it out, and they're thinking it's not true. They don't understand maybe this thing that you have talked to them about because you haven't really modeled it very well. And they're confused. Is it a true salvation? Is it a true thing? Is it true forgiveness? Is this really for all? God's reach is not beyond anyone. And we can live out His promise, His love, is transformation for us. Now, I told you, James is tough. He's, he's, a, he's a hard, uh, hit you straight on person. But his scripture was inspired by the Holy Spirit, given from God for us to study, for us to meditate on, for us to uh, take from and improve our walk. 
So I pray that this word has done that. So if you need uh, to pray this morning, if you need to come forward, if you need to uh, just uh, come forward and give thanks, Father, that uh, your spirit would have the freedom to do that. Move in our hearts. Draw us close to you as we sing this last song.